it's a pleasure to be here. I, I'm a trustee of Dokomomo, which is um steady and quiet profession. And um so it Dokomomo is only run really by people of um long and slow passion. And I like to say there are many people who run Dokomomo, but I'd like to give a special thank you to Philip Boyle, who's been a long-term animator of Dokomoma and is an incredible knowledge source. And then there are people in the uh, working party who actually make these lectures, but also Tom, who's just joined recently and has projected a new energy into the institution. So thank you all those people for making Dokomomo continue. Um, there are many books on Leverens. Um, this double volume, I particularly like, it's, it's out of print. The, the reproduction of the drawings is beautiful. And that's quite difficult because many of the drawings are in pencil, so it's very, very hard to capture them. So this book, if you ever lay hands on it, would be satisfying. A plus U recently published um, an issue, but the drawings are by no means as satisfying as the one I just showed previously. And this book, which was given to me by um, a friend, a friend who was a city architect in Skona, but was a stagiaire in at the time of Leverance. And we visited with my students, we visited a, a building in by Bernd Newberg. There was a small school of very interesting local architects who in later life embraced Leverance and cared for him when he moved to Lund. But my friend, Pear, we were looking at uh, the um, Lund archive and he pointed to a step which was made of um, Durbar. And he said, I designed that as a year art student. It was completely touching. And he gave me this book. He said, um, I hope it's okay. I translated it. So it's very special. I don't know if it's been, there's another book with a similar name. I don't know if it's the same one. Then this enormous catalog for um, the exhibition, which recently closed in Stockholm, which was an exhibition of um, Leverance's entire archive. Um, and of course, there's Caroline Constant's very fine book on the Woodland Cemetery. Now, with the exception of this book, all of the books that I've mentioned seem to offer very little by way of explanation of why Leverins did what he did. And they constantly fall back into speculation. And I don't want to do that tonight. And I, I, what I've discovered this evening is that th this magazine, which was written by his contemporaries who were around when Leverins was practicing, they understood Leverins. There were just a few of them, but they understood Leverance. Leverance wasn't the mystery that he's become. Um, we tend to think of Leverance from this photograph, which was made in the 70s when he was doing his last project in Klippan of a taciturn cigar smoking old man. But in fact, he was stylish, you know, he, um, he was a dresser. If you, I'll show you a photograph later of him wearing a white roll neck and black braces at 77. And, but when he was younger, he was very dynamic. He, he in his early days, um, he was involved in retail design, graphics. He designed boats, shop fronts. He was a patent holder for Edesta, which was the company that made metal windows. He also was an expert in crematoria and the design of cemeteries and incredible, well, not incredibly, very wide, widely traveled. So a picture of him as being taciturn's not actually right. Um, now I've arranged this lecture chronologically because I think 
it doesn't cover everything that Leverens has designed, but it shows really big changes between projects. And I'll start in 1911 when he was in partnership with um, Thorsten Stubelius. And this is the boathouse in Dewar Garden, um, sorry, the boathouse in Dewar Garden for the um, Stockholm Rowing Club. And what strikes me about this project is, and this is my interpretation here, is that that he, I think Leverens understood how uh, vernacular architecture would so easily do something like this, would distort the shape of the windows, would add a, an element to a building. And it's even more pronounced in the um, workers' housing um, that he made with Torsten Stuberius. Uh, we see a symmetrical facade, but with the windows and the doors placed where they need to be. In um, 1915, Leverence, in combination with Asplund, won the competition for the Woodland Cemetery in S Stockholm. And they won it with a very comprehensive scheme. Before that, um, in, when Leverence was with um, Torsten Stubelius, they had made a cre crematorium project, a speculative one, at the Baltic um, exhibition in Malmö. There was great interest in cremation, which we think of as a, a deadly subject, which it is. But, but at the time, there was a change. To, how would they bury people of different faiths in greater numbers? And so cremation was of interest. And in fact, even um, uh, Schindler made a, a, a uh, graduation project in Vienna for um, cremation. So it was very much in people's minds. Um, this project for the Woodland Cemetery um, lasted a very long time. It was um, subject to control by the um, cemetery authorities, public impact on it, but also there was a group of architects that, that to which Aspen and Leverens were arguable, un answerable. And I think what that did is it, it produced a project which, where the kind of tropes that were seen in the Baltic exhibition, where they had um, buildings which represented um, the river Styx and things like that, very obvious um, uh, imagery, was all subsumed into a landscape, a landscape which Carolyn Constance says was a joint design with uh, Asplund and Leverens. And in my view, this what is so affecting about this is that it offers a, a pagan version, a naturalistic version to the view of people who are coming to see a burial and are seeking some consolation. The whole of the landscape and many of the details in the buildings are about birth and death. And with the part that I'll discuss here, which is the Chapel of Resurrection by Leverens. Um, I'll just go back. One, one goes across the top of this hill and down a pathway through the woods, a pathway called the, the Way of the Seven Wells. And you go through pine trees and it's, it's completely unlike any other graveyard where you would see a huge array of just graves. There's something very consoling about this. To visit, one could imagine the grave of, of somebody you loved in the quietness of this space is very, very special. And at the end of the Way of the Seven Worlds is the Chapel of the Resurrection by Leverens, <clears throat> which I think we all know is, is very late classicism. I have to admit, I find this a very difficult project to discuss, and that's my problem. But it's um, classicism at the end of the life of classicism. I mean, I, I'm a, by instinct, a Palladian. I, I like that architecture, which is close to um, the, the Greek roots that 
that produced it. And this inventiveness, I, I don't get it. You know, it just doesn't talk to me. Like in a way, I find this uh, way of working in um, in um, Venturi's um, National Gallery also has a lack of authenticity. But it's an amazing building. But it is also in its interior, which I've been in. It's it's uh, very very austere. And what I think separates Leverens from Asplund is that Asplund's buildings in the Woodland Cemetery are extremely good at consoling people. The imagery that you approach when you go to the Woodlands Chapel is of a tiny building in the woods, which I'm not going to show. You. And then you go inside it and there's a cupola. And in the other big building, um, there are side chapels where you can go because the whole nature of cremation is it's a business and it's an industrial process. So having competed for a um, crematorium, you find that that they hurry people through it. It's very unpleasant in a way. And so you, Aspen understood that there needed to be moments where people recovered from losing somebody. You know, when when somebody disappears and you know their body is going to be cremated, it's a it's a shocking experience. And Aspen Leverens offers, in my view, no consolation. And it's that's current through many of the projects until until the church is at the end. So in this building, there's an upper room which is for a priest and it has a view hole. So it, it's all very curious. And this is one of the drawings from the book that I show the double volume. And we can see that that there's a slight adjustment between the portico and the building itself, which Asplin did in the Villa Snellman. I'm very unconvinced by this. I find it rather mannered, and Asplin can be very mannered. But this photograph is the one that, and this is from the Arc Des catalogue. This really convinces me of the beauty of this building, the massive scale of it, which, although you approach it and you see it from a distance, that scale isn't so apparent. But when you see it from the side, where you come out, you come out the side of the building into the graveyard and you sit in, in comparison with the, the building to the left of it, that's really shocking and beautiful. In 1916, um, Leverance was also engaged in the Mamo Eastern Cemetery in, um, in Mamu, and this is a completely different um, location. It has none of the drama of the Woodland Cemetery. It's very flat. It's the Scanian landscape with hedges. And he um, produced schemes that were not built, which were extraordinarily um, uh, Ledoux-like, but then built much more modest buildings. And then later, as I'll show, two chapels, one for St. Gertrude and one for St. Knud. But in 1928, to 32, he made an office for the National Insurance Board in Stockholm. This is a very perplexing building. Um, we know the um, interior, and we know the exterior. The story is that as a cost saving, the, the street elevations had to be made of load-bearing material, whereas Leverens had planned them in um, steel frame, and steel frame is used for the interior courtyard so that the windows could be more numerous because the light was less and um it's interesting because it there's nothing here of canonical modernism there's no none of the means that Corbusier used to promote a completely different spirit for architecture and I'll get to that in a second but so it's a very curious building. In, inside it's made of stone, outside of stucco. And that all of the windows are by the Edesta system. It has considerable elegance, especially in the plan. Um, we can see that that's the party wall and there's three walls, these three facades are to the street. So these offices are oriented toward the court and then the other ones are oriented to the street. It has 
here rather spectacular spiral staircases, which Peter Selsing replicated in the um, in the uh, art building that he made in central um, Stockholm, um, the Couture House. But this is very special. This is a, a photograph at the time of construction. Um, and this is my, my modest photograph of it. But the, the elegance I see in the metalwork is very great, especially here where a handrail just meets a vertical. This is um, uh, fire-resisting glazing, um, wired fire-resisting fire -resisting glazing. And then the way that the stairs are laid out, I mean, contradictly, you would expect this post to be here so that the rails meet at the same level, but Leverens did something else. But a, a wonderful composition of stone and metal. But <clears throat> having said all that, having said that, or which I haven't said, that um, Leveren studied lots of different treatments for this facade, more sort of Beaux-Arts treatments, you might say, which he abandoned. And, but it works very well with its surroundings. It, it talks to this more ornamented, um, quiet, late um, Scandinavian classicism. And from the park, it works extremely well. But did, in 1930, we know that, that um, there was the Stockholm exhibition, which was the first essay into um, modernism in Sweden. But I don't think that Sweden, well, Sweden certainly wasn't part of that group of countries that, that created modernism. That was Germany and France and to some extent Holland. There was a slightly uh, weak quality to all of this. It's very charming. And there's a myth that somehow a, a hum humanist modernism occurred in Scandinavia, but I don't think it did. It's interesting. I just read a piece um, where uh, Aspen wrote to um, Francis Yerbury and said that they weren't embracing modernism, that history was still important to them. and that. For them, functionalism was much more about the psychological effect of a building on people. <clears throat> the Villa Edstrand, which he made for um, Mr. Edstrand, was a, a, a steel um, constructor. It is something that's it's a building. It's very hard for me to explain. It's not. It's not Corbusian. In some ways, it's even closer to Dutch modernism, the Dutch modernism of um, Rietveld, where it's. Um, unashamedly brick is used and there's a, an additive quality and then a, a staircase a look no hand staircase which i wouldn't want to walk on in 1933 to 44 there was a long procedure for the malmo theater which in the original competition leverins won it outright but then when the project was put on public view it was rejected very soundly by the public who favoured the second prize, which had been made by the architect Hilden and Lallestead. And so the municipality, in the end, decided that they would get Leverens and Hilden and Lallestad to work together, so, which they did. So it's very difficult to um, talk about authorship in this one. But one thing I, I would like to talk about is, is the urban quality here, of which I don't have a photograph. Well, I have a, the next photograph, which, because it has a huge piece of sculpture and it doesn't say what I want, but, but the incoming road comes right up to the front of the building. And on the, this side, there's a, a low building with a, a roof terrace on it and a cafe underneath it. And it creates a square from just two elements. It's miraculous. And then over here is the um, uh, Kunsthal for um, Malmo by, um, uh, by uh, Klaus Ansam, which is, I'm not going to show, but it's an amazing building. But that said, the delicacy of this, the way that, let's say, um, stone is used and behind it, there's glass. And even when there's no relief, the patterns of the columns are carried through and the pattern of the stonework is very careful, carefully managed. And so Leverance is in there somewhere. 
in 1939-43, Leverens um, realized two chapels, chapels of St. Gertrude and St. Knut, which, as I said, the Malmo Cemetery is very flat. And um, so these buildings are approached, there are hedges which delay the view and then gravel paths which lead you to these two buildings, which are almost identical. I mean, it's sort of perverse in a way to um, make two identical buildings. And um, I'll just go back. Those two identical buildings here and here are joined at the back with a large um, crematorium. And there's a chapel in here that I don't really understand. But in front of them, they have these um, pergolas, which are partly wood. I'm, I'm very unsure about whether they keep the rain off or whether they don't. I think there's some stone in there. Um, you will see in this photograph, which I took, that this part is missing and it's been destroyed. And in fact, the next photograph shows the restoration of that by um, Johan Selsing. The exterior is made from um, uh, offcuts of uh, marble. Uh, when they um, uh, when they made marble sheets, there were pieces left over which um, Leverens used. And, and John Clues advised me that some way into the project, there weren't enough offcuts, so they had to make some offcuts. I mean, this is a gesture in a sense that it, with Leverens, they're quite often gestures which are artistic gestures, which seem to have a base in um, practicality, but practicality wins. And then there are moments like this, which are pretty marvelous. And then juxtaposed to that is something completely of its time, a lens concrete, concrete precast piece. So we see it here, and then it makes a room inside and another room. So there are functions to these rooms I don't fully understand, but of privacy, of robing, and things like that for efficiency. If we go into the inside of the, the buildings, this I need to tell you this is a book, a photograph from a book. So the building doesn't have a big fold in the back. Don't be confused. It's just um, it's my photography here. And um, but this is really, really austere. I I I was shocked at how lacking in compassion and empathy these buildings were. But marvelous. And this is the rear. And um, there's another one over here. And then a, a bell tower, which is a very beautiful a concrete frame with stone slabs in it. In 1943, Leverens moved from living in central Stockholm to Ekelstuna, where his factory for Edesta window projects was located. Why he did that, I don't know. But he managed to run a practice from this interior that he made, which was in the magazines. It was treated as a piece of architecture and seen as radical. It's um, a curious beast. And I, I, um, I've, I have to got these off the web so that they look um, what they are, which is very low resolution. But in 1953, Edesta, and Peter Selsing collaborated on the extension of the Stockholm Metro to the suburbs, and Edesta made all of the Metro work. And this was the beginning of a, a friendship with Peter Selsing. It's interesting. Selsing was working in brick for the churches, not the kind of brick that we see later. And I said rather freely to Johan, his son, I think um, Peter Selsing influenced Leverens to use brick. And he said, I've never heard that. So that theory has gone away. Um, at the same time, in 1958, Leverens's wife moved to Skanor, which is in the far south of, um, of uh, Sweden, almost opposite um, Denmark. And he started to design, well, he won a competition for St. Mark's Church in Stockholm which I, I recently visited. So the photographs I have are, are much more personal. Um, it's arranged like this. This is the church. 
and these are par these are rooms related to the church um and then there's parish rooms over here and a street between them and the canopies that we saw here are here on plan so the church is entered from the side and that's what we'll do we'll look at it the pathway to the church is very charming and I, I mean, I'll just let you look at it. So it leads to this building, which where inside and outside, the, it's the same brick. And um, there's a bell tower just as you go in. And then the interior and a, a roof solution with steel beams and arches. I can't imagine why he did this. It's beyond me to imagine that he did this and convinced the competition um, body to build this and then convinced the parishes, parishioners. He says that in using brick for inside and outside, it gave great consistency. But actually, I sense it was an artistic maneuver. It was a a statement that he made that he didn't fully understand. And then as he, as he designed, he found in that statement that he didn't fully understand, he found what it could give. So where am I? Um, so the floor is very different. He, he worked, Leverance worked with a number of ceramic artists who advised him. So there's a great freedom in the, the way that the floor changes. There's no pattern it doesn't represent pathways and things like that it's much more aleatory than that but when it gets to the altar then it really is marvelous because you see i mean other architects would have brought that step over leverance and his collaborators built that step up so you you saw the material again and then the, the altar which is where the brick works very different in in this building, and in the next one, the, the one that will follow, he used thick um, beds and insisted that no bricks were cut. So there was no vertical alignment of the brickwork. And he allowed individual brick layers to um, lay as they wanted. So he had this um, passion for um, chance, you might say. But he also designed all the light fittings. Now, this is either for acoustic reasons or as air supply, or just because he wanted to do it, because these vertical joints completely change the character of the brick. And the lights against it accentuate that, to my eye at least. So the light was introduced in, in different ways. This is rather, it's calm interior. You can see the one that I'll show you at Clipan is very, very dark. Um, but here the windows are made by a duster and are fixed on the inside of the, the building with, with glue and straps and then very simply detailed. And when we get to the outside, you'll see why. Because in having no detail in the window, there's no place for the eye to rest. The eye, to my eye at least, goes across the building and doesn't settle. That's the way into the church, by the way, in the bell tower. So he also understood that coloration of these bricks would, would work well with the um, silver birches, which were on the side when he came. So what we'll do now, that, that facade was here. We'll go around the building here and then come back into that courtyard. So the window that lit the inside of the church is here and it allows Leverance to make a facade which stops being solid and undulating and there's a series of um, separated planes. And then that's all that. And then we'll look at this. So as you... That's these are the windows that I'm talking about. And then when you get to the rooms, they, the fenestration's much more domestic and um, 
very different from the ones in the church. And yet the brickwork is the same. And the the rainwater is playful. There's there's the restraint scene in the church is gives way to this um more joyous and irregular irregular kind of architecture and facade making. And then there's a gate, and you come back to the courtyard, and then there's a a pool. In 1961, Leverance added service buildings to this chapel of the res resurre resurrection, and they're shocking in their casualness. It's extraordinary. It's almost as if he didn't care, or I can't imagine what he was thinking of. I mean, he cared about everything. One of the reasons that I think he was um, ejected from the Woodland Cemetery, which he was, was that he couldn't finish anything. He took a very, very long time to design things because he thought very deeply. So I can't imagine he didn't think about this, but what he was thinking of is a, a mystery to me. And the final, well, not the final, there are other two other projects, but in 1966, um, the community of in Clipan wanted a church and <clears throat> Leverance was recommended to them by the government. And they, um, there's a very funny part in um, the book, 50 Years of, um, of Clipan, where they said, um, the community said, but Leverance is old. And they said, but he would do a good job. He knows what he's doing. And they accepted him. And I think they're expecting, um, some Mozart, and they got Beethoven's late quartets. I mean, this is a really dark church, and there's some reason for that, which is that um, at the time, there was a change of attitude in, um, in the uh, ecclesiastical thought. Although this is a Protestant church, um, Alex, the, the um, hang on. I'm just trying to get to the, there was a, an ecclesiastical um, advisor on, on Clipan and the one in Stockholm. And there was a publication by Alex Rapp, which <laughs> referenced Schwarz, the, the German designer, and said that churches in Scandinavia, or rather in Sweden, had become too concerned with being social entities. You can see what that means in Austria, where I go quite frequently, that the churches are their social gathering places. They're places of very low fear levels. Um, and there was a desire to return the experience of worship to a much deeper level, one that was close to early Christian practice. And some people who see this church um, find that it has, it reminds them or makes them think of the catacombs in which early Christianity was formed. And just to, sorry, just tell you, uh, that's the church. And then the community rooms are wrapped around it. And we'll, we'll start by looking at this. We'll start across the street. So the church is here, and then the community rooms are here. I'll just let you look at this extraordinary facade that he managed to convince innocent provincial people that he should build. And it's full of stuff like this. I mean, you go into the courtyard and then that you've entered that end. And then there's, um, I think there's a youth club in the basement. And he makes the place simply by changing materials. And then further along, the brickwork is much more overt. It's changed direction. And in this project, the, the um, site controller, Leverance would go and talk to him, and much of it was invented on site. The, the account I have is that the site foreman said it was the most interesting job that he'd 
he'd ever done. Leverance, after a hard day of changing everything, Leverance would then go home with the site foreman to the site foreman's house, who then cooked him dinner and continued to discuss the project over bottles of scotch into the late night. I can't imagine that happening with any site foreman I've ever met. So if we enter the church now, well, you see these, and then that's the bell tower. And these are um, very small light shoots. I mean, almost, I think, non-functional. And then the door of the, uh, wait a second, the door of the church is here. There's another door which faces the uh, pond, and it's dark very, very dark. I mean, it, your eyes take time to adjust. And there's this extraordinary structural element, which is in the shape of a truncated cross. At this moment, I say that Leverens was not an observant Christian, as I hear it. Um, at the conference at um, Arc Des, that question was raised. And John, is this correct? That they called Leverance his daughter and asked if Leverance was a church girl, and he wasn't. So this is another mystery. But tiny amounts of light, both um, artificial and, and natural, and then larger areas close to where you might sit. And the font, the font, we, I mean, you probably all know this, but if you don't know this, it's um, a shell that Mrs. Leverance bought in the shop, I think. And I think they said, what are we going to do with this cigarette? Well, I put it in the building. You know? And it, the, the water is on a slot in the floor. I mean, you'd need to you'd get backache bap baptizing something in that, some child in that. But it's, um, he managed to persuade people to let him do this. But the facade that I like most is this one which faces the park at the back, and it's, it is, this time the windows are on the outside. And of course, because they're treated, they're, they're reflective, and you barely can see through them. It's, so it's uncanny facade, facade of enormous carelessness, but very, very healing. In 1969, he made... Um, flower kiosk at Malmo Eastern Cemetery, right at the entrance. And um, I was told, I can't verify this, but Per, my Swedish friend, said that when the, the roofers had finished this, Leverens thought it would look better if it was damaged. And he asked them to hit it with a scaffold pole. And they were astonished. And he invented a, a reason saying the rainwater would run off better. He, you couldn't really you couldn't understand why he would do such a thing. And apparently in the church in Clipan, he asked the blacksmith who'd carefully made of these altar ornaments to damage them. So the man had an inner world that's not communicable. But we all know this project. This project was made before Japanese minimalism, before anything that could be used to justify it. And we know that the the electric conduit is used decoratively, and the ceiling is um, um, foil-backed insulant. And he was in his late 70s when he did this. But at the same time, he added buildings to um, St. Gertrude and St. Mute, which are in the same manner. But how could this man persuade the cemetery authorities to welcome a project like this, he must have had fantastic authority. In 1970, when Leverens had retired, he went and his wife had died. He left uh, where he was living and he had a studio in Lund, which was built for him by his young supporters, Bent, Egg, Bent Eggman, um, 
Krauss, um, Anselm, Bernd Newberg. And you can see he's still a man of style, you know, white raw neck and black. And this is the finishing slide is to show from the beginning to the end how there was an inner world which um, we can't imagine or can, or can we? And I value this book, it's been handed to me. I'll read something. It's written by Leverens about the St. Mark's Church. The architect for St. Mark's Church, this is Leverens writing about himself, was lucky to work under extremely happy conditions from start to finish. Thanks to the competition panel's blessing and a building committee within understanding and trust. The collaboration with Professor Hjalmar Grandholm and engineer Sven Pega was very interesting. Thanks to these two designers, it became possible to make the straight arches in the church completely in brick. A good collaboration with civil engineer Ove Brandt from the planning stage contributed to a successful solution to the acoustic problems. Before the masonry work was started, a number of test walls were carried out to examine the possibility for a more robust wall surface than is usual. The building inspector engineer, Olaf Alberg, was a great help through his experience. Among other things, it was about finding the right mortar mix for the particular case. The brick vault was a question of color in connection with the birch forest. That's such a beautiful statement. Now I've lost my place. Hang on. The uniform, hang on. I've lost my place. The uniform material in the walls, ceilings and floor had to contribute to the complete unity of the space. Exterior and interior wall surfaces consists to the greatest extent of a specially manufactured dark gray brick from Helsingborgs, and I can't name the, the uh, manufacturer because I can't pronounce it, which also predominantly supplied the material for the external paving for footpaths. For the altar and pulpit and for large parts of the floor surfaces, very distinguished ceramic materials were supplied from Hogana. The brick layer was bricklaying was carried out in a free running bond with butt joints of variable width. The free running bond, i.e., the irregular positions and width of the joints, facilitated the bricks of the walls and vaults and the laying of floors. Cut bricks were not allowed to appear. The fact that each bricklayer felt free to work individually also contributed to the lively surface that was the result. The plumb line and guide line were used sparingly. The joint was filled and let the joint was filled and leveled according to the brick surface in connection with brickwork and flooring. The architect participated throughout in the work on the building site and thanks to the building committee was able to lead the way in disputed matters. However, these were relatively few due to the good cooperation and part with the participating technical expertise in different areas, as well as the foreman and work team with highly skilled tradesmen. During the competition period and different periods when the drawing work was carried out, architects John Torinarup and Ola Manderslav Rasmussen participated. The architect was fortunate to receive excellent contributions to the building's decorations and good advice from the artists Barbara Nilsson, Robert Nilsson, and Sven Eriksson. For those who are interested in studying different bricklaying methods, when it comes to brickwork, there is much to be learned from the older architecture of Persia, the forerunner of this type of building. It's when you read this, the mystery that you find in all the texts, which goes away somehow you, when people that were there describe what happened, it's no longer a mystery. It's still mysterious, but it's not a mystery. So thank you. <laughs>
Thanks, Benny. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I'm on, I'm on mic. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a few questions coming in. I thought maybe if I, if I start talking with you whilst sure. allowing people to, to, to respond. Um, uh, <coughs> There aren't any questions. There are never any questions. <coughs> I, think, I, think, I think I have to respond to the point about leverance and religion um, because it was me that was a uh, uh, asked that question. Sure. Could, could, if I if I if I do this, that better. Can you hear the mic? Yeah. Um, I think you have to shout to the room, Paddy. Yeah. The the, the 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 I think the reason I'm here is um, because. A, a chapter of my PhD concerns um, the work of Leverance and, and specifically St. Peter's. And- uh, Is the going to be exposed? No, 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 no absolutely not, no. Um, I, I think um, I think that the, the, there's a, a woman who used to work for you, Nina Lundvall, who I don't, don't think is here, who now works with um, Christopher John and was involved in the exhibition design in art days. Um, he very kindly translated part of a PhD published by a man called um, uh, the, the, the Dr. Reverend Lars Ritterstedt, who was the client for um, St. Peter's Klippan. He, he was the liturgical advisor to the Bishop of Lund. And, um, and when he retired from being a priest, um, he wasn't the parish priest. He was, he was a, uh, an, an art historian by training who, who, who uh, moved around from job to job. He, he was the client for five of... Um, Peter Selsing's churches. And um, it's all actually, when, when I spoke to Johan about this in the summer, Johan Selsing, he, he, he's pretty much convinced, maybe because you pointed it out, that in fact, Selsing and Leverance did influence each other. And I think, I think your observation is correct. I think that the, brick, the earlier brick churches by, by Selsing that he'd done with Ritterstedt um, gave Le Leverance a, a, a way to think about heaviness and darkness and brickiness. Um, and lots of people have observed that actually the architecture of, of Skenor is brick castles. So there's a, there's a, whilst it's shocking and strange of architecture, mm. it's not that unfamiliar to people who are there, from, from there. Um, but I don't know if Vaughan Hart is in the room. Does anybody know Vaughan Hart? He's a um, Dr. Vaughan Hart. Professor at Bath, was, a, was a, oh, still a colleague of Andrew Whitaker's at Bath, but um, he wrote a very interesting essay um, called um, The Half Open Door, where he's trying to interpret the symbolism of um, the, 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 the Chapel of Resurrection. Um, and he, he begins his essay by pointing out that Leverance was um, confirmed age 19 as an adult. So he was a church going Christian as a young person. Um, and the, 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 the essay is published on JSTOR. Um, if anybody has a, a, a academic access to the internet, you can, you can get that. It's a referee, um, I think it's Journal of Architecture, referee journal. And at the end, he credits uh, five uh, Swedish professors um, uh, and says Sigurd Leverance was a, was a Bible reading Lutheran until his death. Oh, really? Yeah. The, the problem is, though, that part of mm. Swedish. Um, and this is kind of Kieran Long's observations. Well, part of Swedish architectural culture kind of reflects the neoliberal side of, of, of post-Christian Protestant individualism to the extent that they absolutely will not accept the authority of somebody with a PhD from the University of Uppsala, I asked Richard Stett's witness. And Instead, it's I. It's, it's all back to I met Leverance, and I knew Leverance, and it's 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 really strange. It's very powerfully anti-intellectual, <clears throat> solipsistic, and um, there's a whole industry of people um, there who are who are kind of knew someone who knew someone who knew someone when he was very very old, and so part of the myth busting which which you've done, Tony, which which Kieran revealed is. That whilst the seven, seven you speak was, up. Yes, but so when Sigurd Leverance was very old, yes, he's he's living in um, uh, Klaus Hansen's back garden in a shed, and he's becoming a kind of demigod. But when he was a young man in Stockholm, he was building buildings for Philips in an office building for Philips, the lighting company, 
was extremely gregarious, very sociable, commercial architect. Yeah. And he <clears throat> fell out very badly with, with, with Asplund. He felt that Asplund betrayed him with the client for the Woodland Cemetery. And um, so, so perhaps the mystery of why he moved moved away was he was heartbroken because he was his best friend and his business partner. And, um, but I, 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 I suppose, anyway, anyway so, so if you're interested in finding out a bit more about, this is kind of what these questions are, are about, is that, yes, there was a liturgical shift occurring in um, the Protestant churches of, of, of Scandinavia. Uh, um, Pre-Vatican II Council. So, so in the Second Vatican Council, what, what, what happens is effectively the priests stop talking in Latin and facing the um, Eastern Wall. They, they turn towards the congregation and they speak in the Volgari. So they speak in English or German now. And that turn is called adversum, adversum populum, adversus populum, I, turning towards the congregation. And it's that that um, Leverance uh, learned from Rudolf Schwarz, but Rudolf Schwarz had a had a theological client. I, yeah, our, our, our great hero, um, uh, Romano Guardini. Yeah, and so so the relationship between the client, the highly educated surgical advisors within the church, pushing the architect to to do new new things is actually the, the, the story that's evolving now that people are starting to realize. But Paddy, why, why, I mean, Vatican II was a Catholic policy. Why would it have affected the Lutheran community in, in Sweden? The, the, the reason this is, so Axel Rapper, who's a Dean Axel Rapper, who's the, 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 the academic um, priest that you refer to, the, the, what, what, what we in England think about Northern Protestantism isn't really true. So Luther, I've just been studying theology at Oxford, so bear with me. I've got like a kind of bloody library about this stuff now. So Luther, of course, was, was an Augustinian monk, never referred to himself as a Protestant, saw himself as a reformed Catholic. And the Lutheran church, like the Church of England, still has the sacraments. It has um, a musical tradition. And the Church of England in the, in the uh, um, I mean, so, for example, when King Charles was, was made king, he, he's promised to defend the Protestant Church of Scotland, but not the Protestant Church of England. And if you speak to people in the Church of England, they'll tell you that they, they're, they're Catholic. In the 19th century, the High Church Anglican movement, the Ecclesiological Society formed by uh, um, Hebel, uh, Pusey, uh, Cardinal Newman, as he is now, uh, along with uh, architects like Butterfield and um, uh, and others were seeking the origins of, 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 of Catholic architecture. But which highly, is highly influential upon the Swedish church, cutting, cutting to the chase. So, so the Swedish and the British um, bishops were in a very close uh, correspondence. And so arguably, if, if you're looking for the origins of, of St. Peter's Clipan, look at All Saints Margaret Street. There's, there's, there's chromatic brickwork, pattern, field, and then the eye is led towards the sacraments through the role of artworks. So in the cases of St. Mark's and St. Peter's, it's the, it's the, 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 the tapestries by Barbara Nilsson, her <laughs> husband, Robert Nilsson, who a, 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 a works in iron, and um, so you have a baptismal font. So the church itself is um, uh, uh, background, but the ornamental elements, some of which are Leverance design, such as the, 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 the letters for the, for the hymns in, in St. Mark's, are uh, um, emphasizing that the church is not a meet, just a meeting place or a place for the word, I, the tradition which in theological terms is known as the Domus Ecclesia, it's the Domus Dei, it's the house of God. And I think that's what, I mean, if you read, um, you, can, you can get adverse and popular for like 12 quid and part, parts of it's in English. So, you, so I don't, I, it's a mystery to me why the Swedes haven't bothered to read the client who, it produced the churches of Selsing and Leverance, other than a kind of extreme narcissistic anti-intellectualism that is almost bizarre. But there's, 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 a, there's such a degree of collaboration between architect and client to the extent that the reason why St. Peter's Clipan is called St. Peter's is because Clipan 
means rock. And rock in Latin is Petri. And in Matthew's gospel, he says, you are the rock on which I will build this church. So th there's, there's such a degree of wit and intelligence at play that's kind of irregardless of, of, of Leverance's explicit or implicit Christianity. What he's doing is he's a modern architect who's working in a collaborative fashion with experts, including iron workers, um, artists, sculptors. And that doesn't fit a lot of our historians views about art in the 20th century, which is supposedly produced by individuals on their own. Mm. Let's take that's some the questions thing. from the so, audience. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of answering the, the, the thing about this. Now, what, what a lot of the questions are getting at here, Tony, are, are, are around this point. Um, so to be kind of, so the, the one very precise question is, um, you, you say that the church rooms of Sigurd Leverance appear to be very harsh and not very caring, but what are the spatial aspects of other more um, classical sacred rooms that you, that you find lack, 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 lack caring? Is it, is it, do you think, and this is a, I mean, that's my interpretation of the question because I'm trying to understand what, what exactly they mean by it, but do, do you think there's a shift from the early kind of late classical architecture which perversely, usually people assume to be more popular, ornamented and warm. <laughs> but then the later architecture, which is actually more severe and dark, do you find that more caring and comfortable? No, I think I, I, the comparison I was making was between Leverance and Asplund. And Asplund, Asplund um, had an understanding of how people would feel before, during, and after a, 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 the departure of somebody that they loved. And you can see it in Aspen's small chapels outside the crematorium that he made. Um, I don't see that in Leverance. I, there's a feeling in Leverance, and this is my feeling, that, that somehow you get dead, so what? You know, it's really, um, it's very, very, it, in, in St. Gertrude and St. Knut, that's very evident to me. In, in um, St. Mark's in Stockholm, there's great um, warmth, you know, there's great um, embrace. People stand in that church and who come to visit it and they're astounded by its beauty and the religious quality that it has. So it's hugely successful as a place of yeah. worship. I think you're right. I think I, th I think I think it's got to do with the presence of other people's work as well. That there's because the warmth of the the, the fabrics right, and the the, the, the ornamental re representational character of Barbara Nilsson's work in particular. I think that, but but I think that 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 is a, it's a change in the 20th century's attitude towards religion. Because, because, you know, pre-Vatican Council, you go to church, the priest doesn't look at you, he's mumbling in Latin. If you can't understand Latin, you don't really understand what's going on, they're facing the answer. And suddenly, there's a kind of engagement with the, 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 the need to communicate. I think, I think that's, I don't, th I don't think necessarily that that's leverance. I think it's just what's happening in the 20th century. But he seemed to have a, a very, um, a very, almost like a friendship with Rittestet. And, and Rittestet was, was, quite mischievous this is this is the, the client okay let, let's take another question Sorry. yeah there's not there's, there's lots of love here there's not many questions here are you guys up for answering questions please Sorry, it's very difficult to hear i i can't hear i'm terribly sorry Maybe if you tell me, I'll tell you, maybe. Yeah. If you shout, yeah. I'm deaf in one ear, he's deaf in both, deaf in both ears. ears yeah. Do you hear that? So, no. But I'm going to compensate. Let me just do this. Um, he, the guy asked, um, 
can you put into words what is it about some of the architecture that feels austere and what um, and what about and what is it in some of the other buildings that doesn't feel austere well in St Gertrude and St Knut um there's none of the animation that you see on the interior of um of St Mark's none of the richness of shape very little I mean you enter a room which has its own shape light coming from one direction the inner materials are not manipulated they don't have any of the visual interest that that the two later churches have um it's it's there that that Leverens provides consolation As, you, sorry As, Asplund's work um it is willing to produce more imagery. And um, I mean, for me, this is an important point. Lowe's made the observation that, that artists please themselves, whereas architects have to please other people. And uh, that's a, a question of intent for architects. And some, I mean, I think Herzog and Dimeron please themselves, you know. And I think Leverance pleased himself. I think Leverance wasn't cynical. I think he just believed that his inner vision was um, all that was necessary. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe if if you were closer to him, you'd find he was much more accommodating. But I think he didn't have the... He had great abilities, but he didn't have the ability to... Um, in, in the crematoria... He didn't have the ability to um, give comfort to somebody who was going through a very difficult experience. He just didn't do that. Do, 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 do you not like the Chapel of Resurrections? Well, I, I like it all. I like all the buildings. I'm making a specific point about, a very specific and for me very important point about how buildings can be. When I made the Listen Gallery, it seems to affect people in a way that they like. You know, it also does other things. Mm -hmm. It it's an architecture of commentary, but it's also an architecture of experience. So uh, let's say in my way of working, I am concerned with making a communicative architecture, which uh, let's say on the one hand deals as closely as possible, as effectively as possible with um, people's experience. On the other hand, on the other polarity, it makes a contribution to visual culture. When we, we made a, a a small religious building in called Faith House, and it was part of a network of buildings, a rural site, which um, were for the rehabilitation of people with um, psychological issues. And one of the um, psychoanalysts who worked there said, you won't like this, but, but that building is a blank canvas onto which I can project anything. And I said, that's exactly mm -hmm. what I want. But at the same time, when you look at it, it's not anonymous. It has form and architectural presence. Leverance is doing something else. That's for me the. It's not a problem. It's just a comparative issue. In the churches, you can't fail to be moved by them. I mean, you. Although interestingly, in that book, Fifty Years of St. Peter's, the parish priest has to go to pains to write a chapter saying. It is a good church, you know, and there's obviously some feeling, some residual feeling in the community that that it, it's too remote, you know. But maybe depth of religious experience is too remote for some people who are churchgoers. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Somebody, somebody, um, Paul Smith has has pointed out that the difference might be that. Um, St Mark's and St Peter's are parish churches, so that there's 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 yeah. you know weddings and baptisms yeah. and joyous yeah. occasions, whereas the, the the obviously the funereal chapels are quite difficult to find a jolly atmosphere that would, would be appropriate decorum, perhaps. Maybe I wonder if that's got to do with it, or, or do you think it's got to do with his? Uh, I don't know. No, there's a specific specific. Um series of um, functions that have to be embodied in a, in a crematorial 
chapel, you have to get people in the front door while people are leaving out the back door. Mm. So you have one entrance, and then at the back there's a garden where people have some time. Um, I mean, I, when my mother was cremated, I wanted to spend time with her body before it went away. I mean, you can't imagine, well, some of you can imagine that there's somebody you care for, you know they'll be it ultimately be destroyed, the last remnants of them will go away. And the priest said, we haven't got time for that. You know, I've got another priest who was a kind of... So it, it's a crematory of quite unpleasant places to deal with by the way that they work and they have to offer some consolation. And most crematoria do, actually. Most small local crematoria know how to do it. They have a garden at the front and a garden at the back and places for sprinkling ashes. And you don't see the works. You don't see the ovens. Um, interestingly, when we were designing this competition for a crematoria, some faiths, I think Hinduism, demand to see the body burned and so the oven had glass sides so they could see the yeah, yeah. i mean there are lots of different ways to see a departure of somebody from this earth i've got i've got to tell a funny story when we we, we went around <laughs> the woodland yeah. the wind, woodland cemetery <laughs> if you go there on a sunday morning at 11 o'clock um people will take you around and they're always art history students and um we were in Asplund's little, little chapel, which Joseph Rickford beautifully described as looking a bit, being a bit Beatrix Potter. It's got a kind of little gold angel kind of yeah. somehow stuck on the through the, the roof tiles, and uh, and the art historian student was uh, was banging out the usual Swedish neoliberal secular um, gaff about there being absolutely no symbolism anywhere, and this Muslim guy goes, "What's that?" and and the art story goes. What you mean the lamb? And there's a there's a there's a sculpture of, of a lamb carrying a cross. I hope I don't have to explain to anybody in this room what that means. But there, there seemed to be like a sort of an absolute denial of the absolutely obvious. Um, but that I, 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 that's that's kind of because I think we we want to think of architecture as heroic and uh, individualistic and abstract. And what you're talking about, Tony, is something else, isn't it? You're talking about communication and, and the emotion and atmosphere and people. Well, I find Aspen's work can be um, sentimental. But actually, in, in the moments that I'm describing, that's not such a bad thing. I mean, you, as a person in grief, you reach for anything you can, you know, and... Um, you don't get it in Goddard's Green Crematorium, which I've been to several times, yeah, me too. saying goodbye to people I cared for. Um, but Asplin did it, and if he is sentimental and a bit coy, then Joseph should wake up to the fact that the world isn't written about this experience, do you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it was a criticism. I think it's just an observation. Yeah, but it's kind of... You think it's dismissive? Yeah, it is dismissive. I mean, the buildings have to operate in lots of different ways. And as an architect, you know, when we made the few religious buildings we've made, you have to provide symbolism without any cynicism or irony. You have to provide symbolism that other people can uh, use for their own ends. You know, you, you it's a very interesting process to be... Uh, scenographic or theatrical but in a way that's decent and so yes of course Leverance is like uh, Aspen is cute and sometimes annoying you know but but in certain situations that helps a lot of people and you know it depends what kind of architecture you want to make if you want to make an architecture which only appeals to people who sort architects out through some kind of strainer you know about who contributed to the ideas of architecture that's one thing if you want to make a, a general appreciation of architects who try at every level that's another thing and one thing I do constantly when I lecture is to say that I'm against 
architecture. I'm against the way that 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 has become part of the capitalism that we have, which is exploitative. That everybody that does uh, thoughtful architecture and caring architecture matters. That this is important for me, and Leverance is great. And I've voiced my criticism, but it's not a big criticism. You can't, you know, you could criticize Beethoven being a horrible person. You, it's too many notes. To let, him, let him be what he is, but know what you want to do yourself. <clears throat> my, my initial experience of leverance was like, it's, it's, it's incredibly powerful spatial experience visiting his architecture almost more than almost any other architect one shot you know kind of kicks you in the solar plexus the Yale gallery of sharp by Louis Kahn there's, there's very few experiences I think of 20th century architecture that have such a physical effect um I don't know if, if people have been to see the buildings um obviously the, it's kind of always, it's always mediated it's mediated by you know black and white photographs, Connors and John Wilson's writing you know, for us in, in England. But it is so awesome that... Um, what leverage is work. Yeah, I, 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 it's just so powerful. And it's only later that you, the more you, you read about it, that it starts to reveal kind of strange secrets. And it, and it occurred to me that like some people like dancing and some people like reading lyrics. But the kind of impulse to read lyrics is only because it, it makes you dance or, it, or the music is so beautiful that you feel you want to know more. And, and a lot of architecture, like, I, I don't want to be rude, but, you know, you, there's a lot, a lot of architects like, like Peter Eisenman and, and Annie Liebeskin, where it's almost as if the, you, you need a book to understand the building because there's not much building, there's just a lot of book. And I suppose that's your, your point. Um, but it is, it is, it's, 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 it's extremely affecting physically and I think emotionally. It, it's, it's very moving. Um, I, I, I think I unusually adopted a phenomenological approach, which was, which was to participate in the building. So to go to the building, to go to St Peter's Stefan when there's, when there's a, a service on. And, and the extreme functionality of it comes to the surface. You, you, you really become aware that it, I mean, it works incredibly well. It's really, really clever. At the end of mass, as you go towards communion, there's a tapestry hanging. And, and as you approach the altar, and after you've kind of been there for about you know, 50 minutes, your eyes get adjusted to the gloom. Um, the, the, the one side of the tapestry is bright red which is symbolizing the passion of Christ and sacrifice and death. And as, as you turn after you've taken communion, the other side is blue and the proportion of it hanging in the sky is exactly the same as the West Gate, the door of which they open. And so you see the sky as a painting <clears throat> and you see the real sky reflected in the lake outside, the pond outside, which I, God becomes man, man goes up. It, 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 there's a whole kind of different level of experience than the most modern architecture. It's not just awesome. It's not just a romantic, um, you know, individualistic, uh, alienated uh, sense. It, it's, it's extremely communicative and well used and well loved and cared for. Um, and, and I don't know what you think, but I, I I, I, I actually think that Sigurd Leverance is the best architect of the 20th century. Because whilst Corbusier is an amazing form maker and you know, Louis, Louis Kahn's proportions are absolutely glorious and tectonically awesome, th th there's just a dimension of uh, actually of care and, and collaboration in his work, which is so humble and it, yeah, it's so, it's so. I find I find it really moving emotionally and politically as an architect to 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 to, to see that level of um, audacious craft and skill and almost arrogance in his capacity 
but also total humility and um, ability to change. Uh, it's it's so nourishing from a human point of view that 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 somebody can that that their work can change. And should we stop the lecture? You, now? Do, 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 do you disagree? Uh, do you I, think he's I, agree. Good? I mean, I when I prepared this lecture, I knew <laughs> it would be very difficult to talk in the terms that you're talking because I don't have those skills and I was very unsure about doing this lecture as one practitioner looking at the work of another so that is a limitation which I accept um, but it's been a, a let's say a process after the after my lecture of understanding of the burnings in different ways let's put it that way and I'm very open to that so I, I'd like to conclude there, unless there are any other questions. Philip's nodding his head. We are. We are. We are. We're doing that. We're stopping now. Well, I wonder, I wonder if you put your hand up, has anybody been to see the Leverance buildings? That's nice. Right. So much, and, and if you've not been, are you now going to go and see them? Yeah, I, th I think that's the that's a great um, uh, contribution you make, Tony. Is you describe buildings in a way that, as as a human being visiting buildings, um, and that compassion and and uh, perceptive sensitivity is 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 a really great lesson. I think it's I think it's um uh, a great skill, and I and I think that's the that's the offering. The, 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 I mean. You know, architecture is architecture. You've got to experience it, haven't you? That's the thing. The, the thing that makes it an art form, though, is that you continue to experience it in your memory, your conversations with friends, like like a good film. You know, you leave a really good film. You want to go straight to the pub and you want to talk to people about it. And that's how I feel now. So, mm -hmm. thanks for a really great film, Tony.